This is Jessica DeVita and I'm with Azure DevOps. I hope you'll enjoy this conversation I had with Dominica de Grandis from TaskTop just a few weeks ago and let us know if you have any questions or comments. Thanks again and Happy New Year. Hi Jessica. Nice to chat with you again. That is so nice to see you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Dominica, you are the Director of Digital Transformation at TaskTop, is that right? That's right. Wow. Well, I um, I would love to know more about what you know what that means, but um, I also want to say too that um, I think it's been a year since your book came out, uh, Making Work Visible. Um, it's been just over a year, right? It has. Yeah, November is that the DevOps Enterprise Summit 2017 in San Francisco that the book was launched. Very cool. Well, I thought, um, you know, all, all over this past year, I've been just seeing all the um, really good commentary that I see comments on Twitter, um, people sharing their favorite quotes and sort of, and, you know, and I have my copy, which you signed for me. Thank you so much. And like, I, um, I don't have a copy of it with me, but it's just so good. I really encourage, um, if you haven't had it, if folks are watching and haven't had a chance to pick up Dominica's book, um, please take a, take a look for it. Um, it is um, making work visible. To hear about TaskTop Connect, it sounds like you had a great conference there last week. We did. We all gathered at the museum in Washington, D.C., had a blast. Yeah, it was a combination of Tastopians, that's what we call ourselves, like Mick Kirsten um, pretty much emceed the event. Um, so as we had Tastopian speakers like Carmen Diardo and myself and Mick Kirsten, along with some task top customers, uh, talking about how they're using the product, how they're making their work visible, how they're making their connections visible, which was one of the talks that I gave. Uh, and that's what I'm really excited about right now. I first, I first gave that talk at the DevOps Enterprise Summit in Vegas in October, um, but I, I feel like I've uh, you know, refined it a bit for the Connect talk in, in Washington, D.C. The message that I wanted to convey and the arguments that I want to address is the idea that complexity drives specialization. And we're working with you know, very large enterprise IT organizations. They've got thousands of engineers and hundreds of different projects or products across dozens of different tools, and they've done mergers and acquisitions, and it's just really hard what these organizations are trying to do. And much of the time, there's issues with what I call communication debt, where, for example, an incident comes into production four days ago, but then, and it needs developer, it impacts development, and development finds out about it late. It's sort of like, oh, by the way, you need to fix this thing, and it needs to get out to production by tonight or, or tomorrow. And so that kind of making connections visible is what I was talking about in my talk. One of the ways to make that visible is this exercise that I was working on with Carmen Diarda. We call it the Value Stream Canvas. It's actually a companion piece to Mick's new book. Thank you. Project yeah, to Project product. to Product. Great, by Mick Kirsten. Okay. Mick Kirsten. Very good. Yeah, our CEO at Test Talk. And so the companion exercise, which I introduced in my, which I introduced in my talk at Test Talk last week, is about understanding where demand comes from in your organization. Working at Kanban for so many years, we always draw the picture left to right. And the request, the demand coming in is often a request from a customer or a request, a business request, right, a new feature request. But what I propose is let's start with production because that's where the biggest risk is. And so where do incidents, how do those get communicated? Where do those initially show up? You know, do they just automatically appear on your JIRA board? Or does somebody, does a warning or is somebody monitoring something where they get an alert and that comes in through their ITSM tool or something? And then how does that communication flow actually flow from production through to development? 
so that's where we start. And then I'll say, okay, how do requests come in from customers? Is that through Salesforce? You know, how does something in Salesforce end up in the tool that developers are using? Uh, so it's just simple questions and pretending like you have a blank canvas and drawing those up on a whiteboard, not a Kanban board, but it's um, at test hop. We also refer to this as an ice stream architecture diagram where we get people in, in the room. It's sort of like the first steps that one might do to value stream mapping, but it's not value stream mapping. But it provokes the right conversations on how is our value stream connected, where are the problems with handoffs, because right? usually oftentimes it disconnects in the handoffs between different specializations. So back to my point about my talk and that specialization, that complexity drives specialization, what to do about it. So we had a great time uh, in D.C. The day before, we actually held a meeting with our um, advisory board, and we rolled out an update I've just made to my board game. It's a board game simulation on Kanban that I first did. I first started it in 2011, um, and used it quite heavily, 2012, 2013, you know, kind of when you and I first met. Right, like and I, six years ago. I finally remember uh, being entrusted with the Kanban board <laughs> game and like and getting it back to your hands safely. And it was like, what is in this game? I could, you know, I didn't, you know, see it yet. But you know, it's um, it's exciting to hear about. Yeah. So you've been. Well, it's changed quite a bit in the game now. One of the charts we use is flow distribution. So this is the different kinds of work. This drives the critical conversation on prioritization. What is your explicit policy for prioritization? You know, are you are people using ROI or are they using, you know, whoever yells the loudest or you know, highest paid person's opinion or cost of delay? You know, what are people using to prioritize? Well this chart actually shows like blue here is features, orange is defects, Green is technical debt, and there's a bit of bright yellow on here for risks. These are the four uh, flow items in the game, the work item types that flow across the board. Could you hold the that up again for a little bit? Thank you. Yeah, I just want to yeah. peek at it for one more. So these are the flow types that you, uh, or the work item types in the game. And, and then the other axis yeah. is percentage of work items. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. Great. So, Right. So how this powerful first, is this? Yeah, so on, so on this first day, there's only blue. Yeah. So this is saying that all we got done were features, right? And then the next um, game, 50% was orange, that's defects, and 50% was technical debt. But you can start to see this ratio over time and understand what we're delivering. You know, if, if, Develop, if technology teams are being promised that they're going to have some capacity allocated to fix technical debt, but then all of their, yeah. all of the, everything they're delivering is just features, then that raises the flag. Like you can no longer deny that we're actually getting some technical debt fixed when everything that's coming through is feature, feature, feature. So that's what flow distribution uh, shows. And it's a way to help teams and organizations understand the need to allocate capacity. How do they want to do that? You know, it's going to change over time. If you're just trying to get a new feature out the door, maybe all the work is feature work. But then after that feature gets released, now you have time, or, or now you're going to allocate more capacity to work on defects and, and risks. Um, I did give a talk with Mick at the Connect Conference in DC on flow metrics. And he tells of this story of Task Top that's quite compelling. It's in his book, too. Mm -hmm. When they were rolling out Hub, you know, basically our new feature a year ago, they were working very hard to get a lot of these features out. And they take team happiness quite seriously at Task Top. So they send out net promoter score surveys for team happiness. 
and some of them were coming back rather negative. What, what they found out was you can't just get an NPS score for a functional team. That if you're working on a product, you need to get the NPS scores, the employee satisfaction by the value stream. And when they started measuring that, they could just they could see that there was some unhappiness with the value stream that was working on Hub and able to course correct and introduce capacity to work on technical debt. Wow. This it's those videos should be out pretty soon. I can't wait to send those to you. But oh, that would uh, be I really great. enjoyed my talk with Matt. Um, when it, when we talked about co presenting, I said, Matt, can we please banter back and forth? If there's one thing I struggle with, it's a co presentation where one person talks for fifteen right. minutes and the other person talks for fifteen minutes. It's like you might as well just do two separate talks, right? There's a reason that we're both on stage together. So we did this crash course in flow metrics. So the flow metrics are flow time, flow distribution, flow velocity, flow load, and chart here. This is just showing how much of your work in progress is features, defects, yeah. risks, and um, technical depth. So I'm going to introduce the topic and real quickly talk about why it's important, how you measure it and then hand it off to Mick who would talk about these concrete examples that happened at Tostop or with one of our customers. I Very wish you good. could have been there, Jessica, it's good fun. I, it's on my list. I am crossing my fingers that I can go next year. That would be really cool. So oh. when you did when you did the, um, the talk and um, started to show these kinds of examples, like what kind of feedback have you gotten? Because it feels to me like uh, I mean, presenting this, you know, kind of information to a team, you know, and getting them to sort of participate in the process, like, that feels like, you know, some sensitive areas to, you know, call out and to try to, but you can't, you can't get better unless you make it visible, right? Tell me, talk to me about how people are responding to this work initially, you know, when they first get this chance to, you know, uh, to rate themselves in these the work in this way oh oh you mean specifically at test talk with the yeah net or just score? well when you um you know when you are doing the um the flow metrics and you're having people oh, complete yeah tell me yeah i'm just curious how what's what's it like for people who are yeah. experiencing well that? so a lot of this like knowledge isn't good enough right it's right. what behaviors do people start to pick up uh, after any kind of workshop or training? Mm -hmm. and, and much of this just depends on the culture of the organization. I feel like we could have like John Oswald in on this talk too. Um, mm -hmm. And the examples that I want to talk about are, will people make work visible so that it actually shows up in the system and, and it can be, we can measure that versus working under the table. I mean, that's right. a big thing because we can talk about making work visible, but if people aren't okay with making their work visible uh, and they're, they're doing all this work on weekends and, and evenings, then it's not gonna show up in our metrics. It's gonna be incognito. Right. Um, and so that, you know, will people, are people okay telling the boss early on why or that work might be delayed so that they can actually do something about it before it's too late. Before it's too that's, late. That's huge. This all requires a level of safety that, um, you know, depending on how, how safe people feel in the organization, it will make a huge difference in implementing these practices. Mm -hmm. Another one is, uh, will people complete work uh, when it's expected before taking on more work than they have capacity to do, which you've probably heard me ask that before. That's one of my favorite questions. Why do you take on more work than you have capacity to do? Yeah. And there's a variety of reasons, right? One, I don't want to let the team down. Two, because the boss said so. Three is that's how we roll around here. You know, we're just allocated at 100% utilization all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, so these are some of the questions that when we get down to it, 
impede people from making their work visible or getting their work done. So what we're trying to do, I one of the things I do in my workshop, go ahead, sorry. Oh, ahead. I, I just, you, you um, there's a couple things you talked about and I'm like, I just want to ask you about them because they're so good. Like, you know, this notion of, you know, are people, do they have this enough psychological safety to be able to, you know, interact with, you know, their, their work board that way. You know, I've been um, reading this book, like The Heart of Scrum or something like that, uh, Tobias, uh, I can't think of his last name at this oh, moment. Oh. Um, it's such a great book, but it talks about, you know, the workflow board um, can become sort of like the, the heart and soul of, the, of a team and it can become this sort of, uh, you know, again, I had a very eloquent quote from the book, um, but it, it, the quote was something like, you know, it, it says to the world that, you know, we have courage, we're, this is our truth, this is our team, this is, you know, the spiritual home of our team. Um, and I thought that was a beautiful way of describing it. But then I also thought about all the ways that people um, are kept almost from participating in a board that way. Maybe it's the, you know, the digital nature of our world where we're all remote and we, you know, have to use, you know, um, digital tools to move our cards from left to right. You know, it's like, do we have um, tools that support the easy sort of like status update of what we're doing or are we going out to another context? And so I guess to your point of, not only do you have to make it safe for people to make their work visible, but I would add too, like, it to me feels like you have to ruthlessly um, get rid of things that make it difficult to track that sort of where I am yeah. on this, right? So, yeah, well, <coughs> a lot of it has to do with how people are measured in the metrics. Tell me how you're gonna measure me and yes. I'll tell you how I'm gonna behave. It's an Eli Goldratt, I think. And if people are measured on activities, lines of code. Uh, you get a lot of code. <laughs> right. Um, and so that's why both in the game simulation mm -hmm. and the flow metrics in Nick's book, and you know, we look at Nicole and Jez's mm -hmm. work with Accelerate, what we're trying to move people to is to look at these outcomes that business people care about, right? But, you know, we we expected this feature to be delivered last month. Like, what happened? <laughs> um, we're looking at speed, how long things take to do. We're looking at um, how much work in progress the teams actually have. Why? Because work in progress is a leading indicator, not a trailing indicator. I say that sometimes people question that. And the example that I give is you know the minute that you get on the freeway yeah. that is back-to-back -back, uh, traffic that your commute home is going to take longer. So that's why we say it's a leading indicator. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're looking at, so the flow metrics, I think it's so important. We're looking at yeah. outcomes. Uh, how much workload does the team have? What is the flow distribution chart that I already mm -hmm. mentioned to you? What are our speed metrics we're looking at flow time? Uh, we like to start the clock. I mean, start the clock where it makes sense to in your organization. We just found that with a lot of our customers, they want to start the clock on when they actually decided that they were going to do something. Like, yes, let's do this thing. Because right. a lot of the work in the backlog, I like to think of that as options. Like options. We might not get to those yes. things. But, but we want to be able to measure, and that'd be lead time anyway. Like, you already have your lead time. But we want to measure when we agreed, when business people agreed to start doing this thing, how long does it take? And then flow velocity is basically the number of items that were completed over a period of time. So that's all often measured by week. Uh, I feel like I'm missing something. Flow load, flow distribution, flow velocity, uh, flow time, uh, oh, flow efficiency, which is how much wait time you know, we said right. that. Um, it takes five minutes to do, but it was in queue for three weeks because he's exactly. the only person that could do it, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and so looking at metrics this way and um, 
instead of looking at individual metrics, you know, how many defects the developer has, for example, right. sort of remove some of that anxiety that uh, people will have. So I think that metrics plays a huge role, mm -hmm. and instead of metrics that drive some right. not so healthy competition. Behaviors, maybe, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, can help move things in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. yeah, it feels like, um, you know, that I, I was wondering too, like, do you suggest uh, to people what, you know, not to measure? Do you, do you come across that in, you know, your work with your customers? Do you, um, do you sort of like notice anti patterns in their, like, in their dashboards that are, you know, again, aligning, uh, misaligning uh, incentives? Like, do you, do you help people get out of those traps? Um, I try to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I try to. One thing, it sounds like the sun is pouring in here. Sure. So, I was at a conference once and I heard an attendee ask a vendor if they could exclude weekends from their flow time. And I couldn't help myself. It was like one of these, like, I should have shut up. But I was like, why, you know, why do you want to do that? Well, because, it, you know, our merit review, right, our performance review is based off of our flow time. Like, we have to cut it down by 50%. So, and any metric can be gained, yes. right? All, you, all metrics are based on assumptions. So all you have to do to challenge a metric is to question the assumption. And if people want to try and not, you know, exclude weekends from their metrics, that just opens up the door to all kinds of questions. Like, oh, so no, so nobody ever on your team works, works weekends. weekends. Never. Okay. Well, what about holidays? Well, what about sick days? Does anybody ever work when they're sick? And then if you start going too granular and say, well, let's only uh, count the actual hours that people work. And let's use that for our flow time. That just goes down a rat hole. It reminds me of that Lucy video where they're eating the chocolates and they're stuffing them under their hat. Because once people think that, okay, this is our actual right. speed metric, then you know they set a target to make it faster. And then you have a real problem. I, I suppose if you were going to measure by hours that, you know, then we could get into flow efficiency and, and whatnot. But that's a much harder mm -hmm. uh, metric to measure, you know, because then you have to show the weight states. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I want to show you, I found them. I found yep. these cards. Oh, fantastic. So this is what the cards look like now for the board simulation game. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Very this cool. This is for, um, this is, you know, green's technical debt, orange is defects, and then blue is the features. Oh, and we have these yellow risks. So there's these event cards and one of them says PCI audit is due <laughs> uh, found, you know, three warnings. And if you don't uh, fix them within so many days, you get fined, you know, $20,000. And so you have so wow. many days to try and get uh, this risk work item across wow. the board. It's just a lot of fun. Um, wow. that people are having and I'm, I'm so excited to have a new version of the game out because it's been a while um, since I, you know, I think 2013-2014 was mm -hmm. when I did the last versions of the Kanban for IT Ops and DevOps and now this game we can play with people all across the value stream from, you know, from product owners, product management, uh, all the way through mm -hmm. and, it, what, and when we finished it last week with our advisory board I asked him what roles would be great for this game and right away you know, scrum master product owners mm -hmm. business people who are you know the voice of the business when they're working with tech teams so I'm looking forward to being able to play this game with more customers and, and other folks at conferences and whatnot so uh, well actually that's that's a Good question too. How do folks uh, engage with you to play the game? Is it through you'll you'll bring it to conferences, of course. But what if someone wanted to, you know, have you come and and uh, you know, d you know, play the game with their teams, et cetera? How yeah. they uh, would so they I just email a, so you or a couple offerings? Yeah. One is a is a two day workshop, 
and I can send you the link to that. I call it Flow 101. Oh, I have it open on screen, the Flow 101 workshop, right? That's the Flow 101. Yeah, it's a way for people to, you know, see that sort of the fundamentals of what is flow. And I do a lot with the inhibitors to flow, which is what I call the time thieves, which are out of my book, Too Much Work in Progress and Unplanned Work and Unknown Dependencies. Uh, So that's a two-day workshop, and we play the board game and do a bunch of other stuff, too, basically, to help, you know, people learn how to experience some quick wins and while they're designing their combined flow system. And then we also do this value stream canvas, as well as a demand analysis exercise and case, I talk about case studies from the field and very uh, cool. That's been a lot of fun. And then, yeah, sometimes I'll bring it to DevOps Days meetups. I'm going to be speaking at DevOps Days New York City in January, so I'll be sure to bring a board game along Perfect. Uh, with me there. Well, speaking of conferences, um, so DevOps Days New York City, um, I will look up and see when that is. Um, what else? January 24th, 25th. 24th and 25th. Very cool. Yep. Um, I will hopefully, I, it would be awesome if I could come to the Big Apple. Um, and outside of that, do you have any other conferences uh, uh, for 2019 that you already know you'll be at? Uh, other than DevOps Enterprise Summit in London in June, you know, I have, yet yeah, the quick answer is no. I'm going to sure. be doing a lot more talks internally. Because the other offering I have is speakerships. Okay. So companies will give me a ring and I'll go out and do a talk at one of their internal um, sure. conference days. Sometimes I'll do some book signings there. And then I'll be, or else I'll be on um, customer sites. Very you cool. Know, a lot of times you put out, you know, we have a great tool in connecting, um, you know, integration between all these different tools. Um, sometimes to get to that point though it helps for me to come talk to them about why they want to do this why flow is important why you want to look at flow metrics and flow work items and make your work visible and make your connections visible Mm -hmm. because a lot of organizations they're still working with a push mentality, let's load everybody up to 100% mm-hmm. and get as much started and in the works, and then you have all this competing work. And, and then and people... then they come in and, like, jump the line, right, with the, oh, but this is more important. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 A decision to do one thing delays a decision to do something else. And the more I work in this area... Mm-hmm the more I begin to recognize that it's not just too much work in progress, but to sit, but conflicting priorities. It, it is. And, you know, um, you know, conflicting priorities is the big one. And, you know, they're all the, all the five time thieves are um, really important, but I do, the conflicting priorities is interesting because in a lot of the incident management and, and postmortem, um, you know, learning review, you know, debriefing facilitations. Um, this this is the same thing that we find time and time again is goal conflicts. And so when you have an incident, um, sometimes you will find that, you know, a, you know, unstated goal conflict actually, you know, made the thing take longer than anyone would have liked. Um, so I think that's a real important area to touch on is uh, anytime there's goal conflicts and competing priorities, um, I don't think anyone can win, <laughs> you know, it's, in that. It's tough. It's what, it's what makes us take on more work in progress. <clears throat> yeah. If we're not crystal clear all across the board yeah. what the number one priority is, we will tend to take, and then somebody else walks up and says, hey, can you do this? Yeah. We tend to say yes, especially if that's the boss. So trying to be crystal clear on what the top number one thing to do is essential, but so much harder to do than to, than to say, you know, yeah, Dominica, <laughs> come to our organization and take a look at this. When I, you know, we've got 50 initiatives yeah. and maybe Maybe the initiatives are in priority order, 
But as those initiatives, as the tasks that are required to do that initiative sort of spread down and out across the organization and impact other teams, yeah. it's it's extremely hard to, to for teams to anticipate what's headed their way and and just what the highest priority is. How much of that um, do you think, you know, comes from the fact that we don't actually know, uh, we can never actually know our systems, like in any sort of, like truly truthy up to the minute sense, like how much of some of the issues that you talk about come from these systems that don't talk to one another, that when you, when an, when a, one team is trying to identify, you know, constraints and trying to work work their work on their flow, you know, isn't it always a constraint somewhere in some upstream, some dependency, and and then always, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's always a constraint yeah. somewhere. Sure. Just where do you want the bottleneck to be? Mm-hmm. You know, so, where, <laughs> that's that's really the question. Yeah. Uh, where where do we want it to be? Yeah. You know, is it up front, you know, or is it just our, our teams is drowning? because the bottleneck is downstream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we see it quite a bit that when teams are unaware of mutually critical information in other parts of the value stream, that's when we get these surprises, this unplanned work, the, oh, by the way, like, did you know that the database schema changed you know, right. three days ago? Right, right. Well, that's, and that's it, right? It's like the, the you know, how does, now we're getting very meta, like how does knowledge even flow in an organization because you have these individuals who have a mental model and they, you know, made that database schema change and then somehow that didn't get reflected and then you have these revelations or, you know, and sometimes it becomes a, you know, a nasty automation surprise or something like that where yeah. you didn't really connect and it's not intentional no. it's just people trying to do their job in it's... the environment that they're in and when we're not looking at the whole system right we're not doing systems thinking we're just looking at our function our team it's difficult to be in somebody else's shoes and understand the the impacts to them yeah um, it reminds me too that I need to uh, send a paper to you that I think you would really enjoy. Um, it's it's called uh, Common Ground and Coordination in Joint Activity, and it's a um, it's a phenomenal paper that gets into coordination costs. It gets into task work versus teamwork. Um, it you know helps a person sort of make sense of the the nuance of how something goes from individuals just in their silos making something to what is a co-created product actually look like from a coordination perspective communications i'm not doing the paper justice but i um i want to send it to what's you what's it called it's called common ground and coordination in joint i love that term common ground well it's yeah it's a terrific paper um common yes, please send that to me yeah it's common ground that's that's to me without reading it uh, it's it's what we're saying when we say you know mm -hmm. optimize the whole understand the impacts along this whole value stream and what might happen you know up front on this side you know how mm -hmm. that's going to impact downstream downstream teams does everybody have a view of the big picture right which what we're trying to do with the value stream canvas is understand the big picture because often the big picture is it's elusive. Yes. Uh, nobody has the big picture, or it's very hard to get the big picture. So I like that. Yeah. Common ground. Yeah, I'll send it to you. I pasted it in our chat, but um, really terrific paper, and I um, have it up on screen. But um, I think it uh, will be really fun for um, for us to talk about next time we chat. Um, but. Very cool. Well, what else? Any closing thoughts on your mind? I just feel like I've um, I, I've got a, you know mixed book that I need to read, um, which just came in the mail the other day, and then um, uh, I got to send you the common ground paper. 
Um, and then hopefully see you at some conferences soon or, or maybe this week while I'm in Seattle, we can get together for dinner. Yes, yes. we should. That'd be lovely. You should come over. I will. I will. Well, Dominica, thank you again. It's been always a always a joy to talk to you. Um, I'm excited about um, the resources you shared today around flow metrics, um, and I uh, I'm excited for people to read more about how to do that in some of the um, in Mick's book um, and in your book. Um, and I'll make sure folks know how to get in touch with you. And remind uh, your Twitter handle is Dominica D, right? Dominica D. Terrific. Well, um, I'm Uber Geek Girl on Twitter, and um, uh, everybody watching, please uh, follow Dominica. She's a great lady, and um, so much fun talking today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jessica. Take care. You Bye. too.